<laughs> so functors. <clears throat> we talked about functors. David talked about functors for a whole hour. So um, f functors are, are like f functor is the word that um, it's like the first um, place that Haskell programmer encounters category theory. They they see the functor and they ask. Uh, uh, where does the name come from? And the answer is from category theory. And usually that's enough, right? <laughs> but, but for us, uh, now we know what a functor is categorically, right? the mapping of categories. Uh, and we've seen a little peek at functors in, in um, Haskell. Uh, <coughs> and today I want to give you more examples and hands-on experience with functors. Functors are really, really useful. And we'll have to like maybe jump ahead uh, a little bit because we'll be talking about some functors that, um, that use uh, recursion, recursive data structure, and so on, which is uh, something we'll be talking about later. But um, you, you really have to have some hands-on experience now to understand um, what functors are in Haskell. Um, so let me start with an example. We've already seen a few examples, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do a trivial example first. Const functor. Uh, no, sorry. Identity functor. Identity functor. Const functor is less interesting. Uh, identity functor is, is uh, we know it's important because we, we talked about um, categories forming a category in which functors are morphisms. Uh, so in order for it to form a category, we need an identity functor, identity morphism, right? So an identity functor just takes uh, an object and maps it to itself. Not a big deal, right? So how do we write it in, in Haskell? We, uh, in, so in Haskell, this is like a function on objects, function on types. Um, but types are data types, so you take a type and you're supposed to define a new data type based on that type. Okay, so that's what a function on types means. So give me a type and I'll give you a data type that depends on this type. <coughs> so it would be nice to have like uh, a, maybe a lambda syntax for this or something like that because these are just functions on types, right? Uh, but traditionally, you know, you use these keywords like data, you know. Data means, okay, I'm s defining a data type, right? So you have to give a name to this new data type. So we'll call it, no, not const, uh, identity. Identity. So that will be the name. But now we want, so we, we could say, you know, like we can start a data type definition and then just say it equals blah, blah, blah. Uh, in this case, we want a data type that depends on an arbitrary data type variable. So we'll put a variable A here. Because this is a type definition, the compiler knows that little a will mean a type variable. It's not a value, it's, it's not a term, right? It's not, it's, it's a type. And this type goes over the whole Hask, let's say, right? Can be any type, I'm not specifying. It should work for any type, just like a function works for any x, right? Um, so that's the left-hand side. The right-hand side tells us how to construct a value of this type. How do we construct it? So we have to specify a name of a constructor. So this will be called a data, data constructor, right? Uh, so let's call it make ID, okay? I mean, uh, David already mentioned that uh, in, in Haskell you often do the panning and you use the same name for the cons data constructor as for the type constructor, and that's true. But just not to confuse you s yet, you know, <laughs> we'll confuse you later. 
for, for the time being, let's use different names. It's, it's perfectly good Haskell, right? Um, uh, so, so this is a constructor which is supposed to take something of type A. Okay? How do we understand this? This is there's like a lot of material thrown at you. So first of all, this part is called type constructor. This identity is a type constructor. Okay? Because it's like a name of a function. It's a function on types that takes A and returns identity of A. Okay? Takes A, returns the identity of A. This is called data constructor. Because this is a regular function. It's, a, it's really a function. You, you, could, you could ask the compiler, you know, like colon T uh, or GHCI, right? What is make ID? What type is it? And it will tell you that make ID is of the type A goes into identity A. Okay? Give me an, a value of A, right? So it's, it's like a function. Give me a value of A, and I'll give you a value of type identity A. Yes? On the first line is the second A a pun, and that could be the A, value A. Make ID A, could that be make ID A? No, no, it has to be the same A. This is, this is the type that you are passing it, and here we are using it. So it's sort of like lambda x, you know, and here's like x square. Or in this case, x, because this is identity, right? So it's lambda x, x. We have to like hide it behind this constructor because of Haskell syntax, right? Are type definitions allowed to have three variables on the right hand side? Like b here? Oh, oh, um, n not really, because what would this be, be? I mean, it cannot be a variable, but it could be like, you could put a string here or something, right? Something that's like in the external environment. But all type definitions are like at the top level, so. Are you defining identity, or are you defining make ID, or are you defining both here? Can you repeat the question for the audience? Okay. So the question is, what am I defining, <laughs> essentially, right? Am I de I'm defining uh, this new type identity that depends on A. And in order to define this new type, I have to say, how do you construct values of this type? So I'm also defining uh, the, the, the da data constructor. Okay. So, so this is like a full-blown definition. We'll see more definitions like these later that the right-hand side will be more complicated. This is like the simplest, well, not the simplest, but yeah. Um, Question? So is the A on the right, is that a value of type A? Or is that a type so, so this is like the type, it tells you what type function this is, right? So A is a type here. And the meaning of this is that make ID is a function from A to type A. Oh, I see. So the type A. A over there, that's saying like that's the input for that function, make ID. Yes. And this is, a, this is a polymorphic function, right? It can take a value of any type, mm -hmm. right? So this is, this is a type variable, so this is a polymorphic function. It's like a really, a whole huge family of functions. It's a, a different function, well, it's essentially the same shape function, right? But it's a, it's a family of functions that, uh, that's parameterized by A. It's yes? a little bit of discussion that I'm going to start here, but uh, don't you think that, I personally think that the syntax is a little bit confusing, right? Because yes. it has <laughs> this uh, data constructor and then the type at the same time, and that's probably what um, makes people ask this question. Like I'm al always confused about it. Don't you think that using gen a generalized uh, ABC syntax would be better? Okay, so the question is, wouldn't um, 
generalized data type, uh, algebraic data type, GADT, uh, the syntax is much better, you think. Maybe, you know, I haven't thought of that, but maybe it is, maybe it is, because in, in GADT, you actually define a constructor as a function directly. You say this is a function, yeah. right? This is the this, these are the arguments. These are. Here I'm splitting it, like I'm saying this, and then I'm saying this is what, what it really means. But this is what it really means, okay? So, yeah. But, but if you are reading Haskell, you, you won't find a lot of GHDTs, you will find this. So, you know, if you want to be uh, fluent in Haskell, that's the syntax you have to internalize. Okay? So this is, the, this is the hard part, is like getting used to syntax and understanding the difference between type constructor. Type constructor is something that takes a type and produces a type. So it takes type A and produces identity of A. So I can, I can call it with, let's say, int. Int is a type, or string, right? And I can say identity string and that that's a type now right identity is not a type yet it needs an argument I give it an argument now I have a type so okay so identity string is a is a type if I want to construct a value of this type right so suppose that I want to say I have some X and it's of the type identity string. What is x equal to? Now I have to come up with a constructor. I have to construct it, OK? Uh, so let me say, how do I construct the value of this type? I use the data, data constructor. So I have to say make id. And what does make id take as an argument? Something of type a. What's type a? String in this case, OK? I have already instantiated it for string, so it expects a string. So I can say make id hi. Okay? Is the body of make id defined somewhere or is it or is that it? Like the, there's some internal logic to make id that's <laughs> not showing. No, no, this is this is just it. That's it. There is nothing more. Uh, there is no nothing hidden. I'm def I'm I mean the name here? Yeah. Oh, you c you can use any name you want. Yeah. Yeah. As long as it doesn't conflict with some other names, yeah. This is also an arbitrary name. I just gave it the name identity, you know. It's actually used in the library, so. Yeah. Yeah? Uh, is type of A is it kind? Type of A. <laughs> yes, oh, it's so a kind, yeah. But can you construct identity kind? Ah, okay. I think that's maybe it's, it's too uh, far away from where we are going, okay? But yeah, yeah. Okay, let's not digress too far. Um, <clears throat> so, um, so this is so far, this is like a, a type constructor. Um, it's still not a functor, right? Is this a functor? That's a good question. A functor is a mapping of types. Identity here, the type constructor, is a mapping of types, okay? It's a function on types. It takes a arbitrary types. Any type in this category, bam, it goes into a new type called identity A, okay? So it's like if you think of this category here, you know, here's string. Here's identity string. So it maps this object to this object. But it maps um, the object as a whole. It's not like a, a, a morphism. A morphism is sort of operating on an object, right? And there can be many morphisms. This is just mapping this bulky object into this bulky object tells you which object corresponds to this object, okay? A lot of people are, uh, get confused between, you know, 
functor mapping objects as a whole and morphisms sort of mapping objects from the inside. I don't know how to say that, but um, it's, it's a different thing, right? It's like in, in, uh, in set, okay, the in set, what would you say? Uh, an endo factor in set says, here's a set of apples, I'm mapping it to a set of oranges. But I'm not saying which apple is mapped into e each orange, that's a function. A function would map individual objects as uh, elements to individual elements. A functor maps the whole bag to this bag. Okay? So previously we've talked about um, types as objects and functions between types as the morphisms. Mm -hmm. In this case, are we considering each type to be a category since we're associating from one to the other, or are we still... Cause we're still within the whole category of types. We are still without uh, this category, and, and these objects are types. We're still types. So this is a type, an object in this category, and this is a type. It's an object in this category. Yes? Um, it's an endo functor, so it's going from the category where the objects are types to the same category where the objects are types. Okay, and so you can have a bunch of different endo functors, but only one is going to be the, the identity functor as an endo functor, but you can have endo functors that are not the identity functor. Yes, exactly. Okay. So I'll repeat. Uh, you can have many different endo functors, but only one of them is identity functor. Okay. So identity functor really, so this, is, this may be a little tricky because an identity functor should take this object and map it to itself, right? That's what identity is. Here in Haskell, we are doing this hand wavy thing saying, this is really the same object, sort of, like we are mapping string into string, but giving a, it a different name. And uh, I'm not going to go into the discussion what this really means. Is this the same object, or is this like uh, isomorphic object, okay? It's definitely isomorphic. Like, we had a big discussion about this the other day. <laughs> it's definitely isomorphic. Right? So in, in a sense, identity functor, endo functor in Hask maps an, an object into an isomorphic image. Okay? Which might be a little confusing. But um, so if this is a functor that it has two parts, okay, yes? What's an endo functor? Endo functor is a functor from the category to the same category. Normally, functor goes between categories. Object in here, mapped to objects in here. But here, endo functor means objects in here, mapped into objects in here. Okay? And the second part is mapping morphisms. Okay? So we have to have something that maps functions. Okay? So suppose that you have like the most general function from A to B. Right? Um, we have to be able to map it into a function that goes from identity A to identity B. That's, that's the lifting part, you know, we call it lifting in, in Haskell or in mathematics also sometimes, you know. So like, here's a, um, a functor f f function from A to B, let's say F, and we are lifting it to a function from FA to FB. Okay, and we call it FF in math, right? Here, in this particular case, this F is identity. So if you have a function from A to B, F is identity A to identity B. So that's the lifting. And this lifting is, well, just take this guy and map it to this guy. So we need a function like this. This is a function, higher order function, because it takes a function as an argument and returns a function, right? 
Uh, it's highly polymorphic because A and B are going over all possible types in our category. No matter what type you give me, no matter what function, I should be able to lift it. And I'll show you this. This is a miracle. You know, it's like any function you give me, I'm not looking at it, I'm just lifting it. And it works. Okay? So, so let's call this function, uh, I'll call this function map ID that's used for lifting, okay? For lifting identities, okay? How would I implement this, okay? So here's the implementation. Map ID, is one word, takes as an argument this function A to B. So let's call this function F, okay? Uh, <coughs> now in Haskell you don't really need these parentheses, this is called currying, and we'll talk about this soon, what currying means, but for the time being, instead of saying I have a function that returns a function, I can say I have a function that takes this as an argument and returns this as a, as a uh, value, right? So, so the second argument to this is something of type identity A. Okay, something of this type, and I will have to produce something of this that's of the type identity B. So first of all, um, I have to have a way of extracting this A, and this is a weird thing, okay? Because um, in in um, uh, imperative languages, you define some data. And then it gets modified, and at the end it has a completely different value than it had in the beginning. In a functional language, once you define something, once you declare, you know, it's like this x will always contain the string high. There's no way of modifying it, okay? Modifying in, in Haskell means, well, create something new that uses this as a template. And every time you modify, you just create a new version. So it's like a version control system, right? So functional programs like a version control system. <coughs> but since this thing is never modified, this thing always remembers how it was created, okay? So if, if, I, if I have this x, it will always remember that it was created using high and was created using this particular constructor <coughs> called MK MKID. Um, we have only one constructor here, so maybe this is not, not a big deal. In the future, we'll have more than one constructor. But the way to extract, like deconstruct the thing, is called pattern matching. And the pattern matching can be done like in place here by writing the pattern here. And the pattern is take the constructor, MKID, and retrieve some x from it, okay? Because mkid takes something of type a, let's call it x. So it will match. It will go, you know, we'll take this and we'll say, was it constructed using mkid? Yes. What's x? x is a string high, okay? Right? So match this pattern against an actual value and retrieve the argument with which it was constructed originally. Okay? Okay, yes. Okay, Z. Good? Yeah. <coughs> <coughs> and, and usually, o often people will just call it A, and then it will confuse even more. But it's, these are different namespaces, so there's no. Yes? Yes. So when you define like identity A equals make ID A, why do you use the same variable A in that definition as opposed to like make well, ID is because this this identity. this A here, okay, the question is why am I using here the same A as, as here and here I'm replacing this seem seemingly this A with Z, right? 
the thing is that he, here this A tells me what type it is. This is like a type declaration of make, make ID. So instead of writing this, you know, I could have written this, but then I wouldn't be able to do the, ta the pattern matching, okay? But this is, this is the meaning of it. So it says map A to identity A. Uh, now, when this was actually called, then A had a certain value. And this value I, I'm calling Z here, okay? So now I have to return something of type identity B. So I have to construct something of type identity B. How do I construct it? The only way to construct this thing is called the, the constructor. So I'll have to call MK ID and pass it something of type B, you know? Something of type B. Do I have something of type B? Nobody has anything of type B? <laughs> well, okay. Well, I don't really have something of type B, but I have a function that returns a B, right? I have this F. Okay, so, so I can get a B if I call F, but I have to call F with, with something of type A. Do I have something of type A? going once, <laughs> I have Z of type A, okay? So I can, I can call F on Z and I get something of type B, I apply the data constructor and I get something of type identity B. And I'm done, okay? And I never used uh, any, I, I, I never thought about you know, what type A is, what type B is. It will work for any type. Right? So this is totally polymorphic. I have never used this information about what type Z is and what type F is. Yes? So um, since in the identity example we had to map to this like iso this isomorphic type, yeah. um, does that mean that if we have two existing types like string and bool and we want to have a functor between them, you have to define these extra isomorphic types to map to and you can't ever have a functor go between two existing types? What, what, what you are saying is you know you know you, you take a particular type mm -hmm. and you say there is a corresponding type. Uh, a, a functor is a function on types mm -hmm. so it has to be defined for all possible types not just one particular type. No I think what you're trying to say can we define function between types? And in Haskell, you cannot generally do that, right? You cannot define a function which maps int into string, maps string into some other type. Well, because just oh. the, the object that says, or the okay. this function takes you from string to identity string, but we weren't able to go from string to string for the identity. We had this uh, yes. extra type. Mm -hmm. so we have this have a extra type, that yeah. But it's more complicated, or leads to two different types in the same category. Do you always have to create a new isomorphic type? Okay, so this this is this is a um, syntax problem more than anything else. Okay, there is a different definition of identity that I could have used, which would use a a, a type um, um, synonym, type synonym. I could say type. Uh, identity A equals A, okay? This would be much more readable, right? Wouldn't it? And it would work up to a certain point, and this point will come soon when I try to define an instance of a functor class, because <coughs> then it will break, okay? So we have to go this circuit way to satisfy the god of Haskell, okay? This is a little sacrifice on the altar of Haskell or the compiler. The compiler just has to like, you know, you have to tell it what you mean. <coughs> okay, any more questions? All right. So, So this is a way of defining a functor for a particular type constructor, right? <coughs> but, but there is a way of 
generalize so suppose that you want to write a function that works on any functor okay maybe this is hard to to imagine but you know, like if you give me something that's that's inside a functor you know some functorial value can i do stuff to it without knowing what functor it was and of course in this case the only thing that you can do is like take a function and apply a function to it using something like map id and and get a new value uh, <coughs> but if you want to do something like this then you have to have um, an abstraction of a functor something that tells you all these things i was talking about are functors right here we we specifically implemented a function for lifting uh, functions but only for one functor and every functor will have to have, have a function like this and all these functions will have a very similar type interface type uh, description right I mean they will all always have something that goes from A to B and instead of identity it will have some kind of functor you know and some kind of functor of A functor of B they, have, they all have very similar what if we can parameterize it by saying okay let's make this a variable okay and the mechanism for doing this in Haskell is type classes type class defines a whole class of types that share certain interface okay in this case this is this goes even further because no, it doesn't define a type of a class of types it defines a class of type constructors that share a certain interface okay so this is a, a little bit higher order thinking right so I'm one um, I try to define a class of type constructors that is called functor generalizing all these examples that I gave you here which is one example <laughs> but generalizing from one example is perfectly good um, so I'm, I'm, I'm gonna call this F lowercase f for this functor because it, it will be a variable so like type variables are lowercase um, type constructor var variables are also lowercase okay and then we say where where this f is equipped with this function that does this okay so how do we write this function we say we call it fmap this is the traditional name for it in Haskell in some other languages called map maybe that makes more sense but in Haskell they started with with map being a list thing and then they had to generalize it so they said functor map okay what's the type the type is takes a function from a to b and lifts it to fa fb okay this is how it's written in haskell if you want to have a cut more categorical picture i would put parentheses here and say takes this function and lifts it to a function like this okay so I use this thing and say uh, I put an identity here and it worked right <coughs> so if I want to show that a certain type constructor f is a functor I have to provide implementation of this function okay so this is the class now how do I tell the compiler that I'm providing now the implementation of this function I'm saying this is instance functor for instance identity okay so I'm replacing f with identity where so I have replaced f with identity 
And now I have to implement this function. Okay? So I'm implementing this function f map takes f from a to b. So now I'm implementing. This is this is the type signature. This is the implementation. F map f make id x. It's okay if I call it x now. Make id. I call it a even. Okay, just to make it interesting. <laughs> okay. So I have implemented. This is the same implementation, right? <coughs> but now I don't have a separate name for it. Here I had to call it map ID so that it doesn't conflict with some other uh, F map, right? Here I can use this name F map for multiple types. That's called name overloading. I can overload this name. And in the future, if, I, if somebody gives me a functor and I don't know what this functor is, the only thing I know about this functor is that it has an F map. And I can use F map. On anything that's functorial, I can use F map. Okay? Because all functors have F map as, as their method. Okay? Just to clarify, the um, type signature is something that's in Haskell, and so you never have to go through and define F map as part of the language? Or is it you have to define F map? Or if you want mm. to use uh, OK, so the question is, is this, how general th is this? Is this part of Haskell, or is it uh, something that you know, a, a, a programmer can invent? It's part of the library, actually. So somebody in the library says, I'm going to define this type class right, with this signature. They decide. And then everybody has to follow when they want to write an instance. Right? Yeah. So this is not built into the language. FMAP is not built into the language. It's built into the library. Yes? Is there a category through the catalog of the idea of the type? <laughs> 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 go, go to twi Twitter and, and look for a huge discussion about it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it nobody knows. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we had a fight about this too. And like, we, cannot, we cannot make up our minds about what is it. Each okay. of us can make up our own minds. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what are each of your own minds? <laughs> okay. Any, anybody else? Yes? How does the name overloading work? Is it that because it's a you state ID there that there's a device pattern matching when you call it, when you call FMAP? Obviously. How this is implemented, you're yeah. telling me? Uh, It's, it's, it's called nominal, right? By name. So like I gave it a name, and this name works for many different functions, right? So this is one function called fmap. I will show you soon another function that's also called fmap, and yet another function that's also called fmap. They have completely different implementations. They have the same type signature, though. Well, not the same type signature. The same type signature with different f's, yeah? One thing that, that, that might be confusing people is in the top we have type class functor f. That f, um, as you noted, turns into identity when you apply it for the identity functor yes. in particular. The f in the f map is not <laughs> the same f, and it needs to be changed over on the right too. Right? There know? is no conflict, okay? The, the, no conflict. Yeah, there is no conflict of names. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's, it's only the, maybe confusing. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. So like F, the, the letters F, A, and B, and X are so overloaded that, yeah, I know. And we don't have the option of making a capital F at the top, right? No, no. No, no because it's a variable. Exactly. It's a variable. So it has to be F. Now, another interesting, OK, let me, let me ask myself a question. Now it's my turn to ask questions. Like, how does the compiler know that I'm talking about the type constructor here and not just the type f? Because I use the letter f? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> because the compiler looks at this and says, how is he using this f? Oh, he's using it here. OK. If, if, if I were applying it to a value, then f would be a function. But I'm applying it to a type a. Because this is a type signature. 
The things in this thing are types. A is type, B is type. So I'm applying F to a type. Therefore, it must be a type constructor. OK? More questions? Um, so I'm trying to match this with my picture of functors from category theory. And um, it's a little weird because these functors are only endofunctors between Hask and itself. Yeah. Um, and uh, but endofunctors are really important, really okay? Important. Because like all monads are endofunctors, yeah. right? So yeah, um, but it's sort of well. Anyway, um, so I see that it's like when you're setting one up, like on where you talk about identity, that says how to do types to types or objects to objects, and requiring in the type class that there's an F map that does morphism to morphism covers that part. But like, what happens to, like if something um, just has F map, does that make it a functor? Or how do you know that it satisfies? No, to, to make it, well, okay, so to make it a functor, you have to, uh, so the question is, uh, what makes something a functor if it just has an F map? Uh, it cannot have an F map because it would conflict with this F map, right? It would say F map can be used only in the context of a functor. I think because you know how it, why it preserves composition and identity. Yeah. Okay. If that's what you want, um, then the answer is no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is something that cannot be expressed in Haskell. This is something that we have to take, just like do a on the side on a piece of paper, right? That this is supposed to preserve identity and it's supposed to preserve so associativity. Like if I'm yeah. a programmer in Haskell and I want to make a functor, and like because I know a little bit of category theory, I know I have to preserve identity and composition for it to be a functor. Um, do I have to think about that when I'm creating my functor? Like, oh, is this actually doing that and do that on paper and make sure? Or if I follow this and I write an FMAP that has that type and I uh -huh. type check, do I know, like, okay, magically because Haskell does this somehow? Okay. I'm only talking about half to half. So the question is, uh, uh, can, can um, the f is, is okay, I don't know what to say. Is there, is there a, some magic in, in it, right, that, that, will, that the compiler will figure out that this is, uh, that, that this satisfies the laws, right? Yeah, or do I have a program? Yeah, okay, so the, the, uh, I'll, I'll give you a short answer, okay? which is semi-positive. Yes and no. <laughs> but the thing is that if you, if, you, if you create your functors using the usual things, the usual uh, m ways of creating type constructors, which are algebraic data types, which we'll be talking about soon, okay? If you're using algebraic data types, then in most cases, um, the compiler knows exactly what you mean when you say, I want this to be a functor, okay? And this will be a lawful functor. So there is a way of saying, uh, instead of doing this, I could have just said here, deriving functor, and I'll be done. Okay, deriving functor. You have to set up a, a, a language pragma at the top of the file, um, deriving functor, derive functor, I think it's called, uh, and it will m automatically work. So you can also derive monad and... Sorry, stuff. I think I'm yeah? being clear enough for my question. Um, it will be lawful. So, okay, yeah, so where's the lawful coming in? Is that like because it's, like if something, if, you, if I give an F map that has that type that's required in the type class, now mm -hmm. Okay, where does the lawful come from yeah. when you are, wh how does the compiler, like when, when you let the compiler derive functor, why is it automatically lawful? It's automatically lawful because it, it, it means that you, you created your, your uh, type constructor using um, one of the typical ways uh, by using products, coproducts, and exponentials, okay? And, and you can prove for products, coproducts, and exponentials once and for all that they are functorial, 
right? Once it's proven and the compiler knows that, the, that it's been proven, right, it will use this information. I think the question is, uh, can you write an instance of functor that will not uh, be a Satisfy law? law? And what will happen if you do this? Will it be small or <laughs> yes, you can write unlawful functors instances. Uh, I, I'm not going to do this right now, but yes, you can, you can write unlawful functors and um, this, the effects of this will be that your program might do something weird, you know, and it depends on the situation. There's no general, it, it won't explode unless something else. But Patrick, you also mentioned that nevertheless Haskell has special properties. In particular, you can only check that your instance satisfies the second law of functor. Yeah, you yeah. The first of because it's Haskell. Parametricity. Yes. Yeah. Theorems for free. Yeah. Okay. But let's let's continue. Um, so. Okay, so I want, to, I want to give you like examples of functors because I guess this is like a trivial functor, damn it. Right? We want something interesting, okay? Unfortunately, we don't have yet the way to create algebraic data structures from first principles. So I'm just going to define some data structures and kind of explain what it means without going into the theory, right? So a very common example of a functor is called maybe. <coughs> and it takes a parameter, like all of them take a parameter, right? So it has to be a type constructor. And this guy has two constructors for the price of one, okay? So it has one constructor called nothing which takes no arguments whatsoever, okay? It just ignores the A. It's like a const, right? And, actually I should say or, there is another constructor. You can either construct it using nothing or you can construct it using the second constructor, this is just A. And this one takes a value of type A, okay? So if you want to construct something of type maybe, you know, so if, if you say I have some x, I shouldn't call it x, okay, I'll call it m. m of type maybe, maybe, let's say int, okay? I can, I have two ways of creating it now because I have two constructors. This is sort of like an or, do this or this, right? So I can say m equals nothing. Ignore this int stuff. Doesn't matter because I don't use it. It's nothing, OK? So this is sort of like, you know, I, I don't know if programmers will probably recognize it. In some language is called optional, right? When you are returning from a function that's not total, then sometimes you say, I have the result, and it's just this. Sometimes I don't have a result, it's nothing, right? Or I can say, uh, I, can't, I can't reuse the same variable, so I will just use the eraser, right? And I say just, and now just takes an argument of type int in this case, because I declared it as an int here, just 42, right? That's the only number I remember. So. Um, so that's how you construct it, okay? If you want to deconstruct it, then you have now two options. You have to ask, was I created using nothing or was I created using just, right? <coughs> so to show that this is indeed a functor, you will have to create an instance of it. Instance functor. Maybe. Where? Okay? So maybe is the name of the type constructor. These are data constructors. Two data constructors here, right? But there's always one type constructor. <coughs> so fmap, 
for this guy. And I will use f again, OK? Um, so let's see. Ah, uh, no, maybe I should use g, because here's g. OK, so this is this g. But now, where is my uh, type class? OK, type class. So it should, it, should, it should produce, it should take another argument fa, which in this case will be maybe a, may, maybe a. So like in parentheses, I will write what type I'm expecting. So maybe a, hmm. I have to pattern match it again, right? So there are two patterns now to match. So I'll, I'll match it to the first pattern and see what happens. Nothing. And I have to return some other maybe A. Uh, uh, there is no other option but just to return nothing, you know? Because I don't have any B here, you know? It's like I'm, I'm supposed to return maybe B, right? I don't have any B. I don't have any A, <laughs> to, to, right? If I had an A, I could apply G and say, oh, here's a B. But I don't have an A, because nothing is empty, you know, nothing there. OK, so this is the implementation for one pattern. Uh, one moment, let me finish this. F map G for the second pattern. So you can just write one pattern after another, OK? So like this, this is the way to do this. If you have more than one constructor, you just write separate cases for it. So now I have something of type just. So it was created using just with some x of type a. Oh, well, I'll call it a, just to confuse you, right? <laughs> now I have to return a maybe b, right? Uh, but now I can, I can be clever because I can have a b, right? I can say, let me construct it using just, the same constructor. Let me apply my g to a, and I'll get a b. And just b will be of type maybe b, right? So it works very similarly. I mean, this works almost identically like the identity factor, which is no coincidence because this is like a sum of two functors, right? The const functor and, and the identity functor. Um, so that, that's, that's the implementation. Uh, what, what can be said about this? <coughs> Just based on these two examples, <coughs> there's a way of looking at functors in, in Haskell. Some people like it, some people don't like it. Um, saying that a functor is sort of like a container for, uh, for uh, values, right? So identity is definitely a container, just contains a single value, right? It, and you can access it, you can retrieve it, you can fmap over it. Um, maybe it's like a container that maybe contains a value, or maybe not. So let me give you an example of a third container, which maybe contains a bunch of values, not just one, right? A list. Um, ba -ba. Where can I go here? I have negative three minutes. <laughs> uh, Why don't we let people come Yes, up? yes. Yeah, so, okay. Sorry, I didn't notice. <laughs> well, I'm going to close here, but there's plenty of time for questions. And yes, please, please ask questions. Yeah. Lecture and half a lecture the other two or people like. So. Right, thank you.